So please, before we do, I'm Jo Fontaine. I'm the MD of Fishbowls UK and off Fishbowls Chief Analytics Officer hosting this webinar today. Mike is a well-known expert in big data and building predictive models to support critical business decisions. He has provided the restaurant and retail industries with custom analytical solutions for pricing, revenue management, product portfolio optimization, promotional effectiveness, menu management, and media mix ROI for over a decade. His use of systematic test and control methodology and his proprietary models have helped a long line of blue chip clients drive more profitable decision making while mitigating the risks that come with change. So now I will hand over to Mike. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, so I, I'm going to start out a little bit about talking about data because that's really where um, where all of the models and where our approach to pricing starts. Um, one of the things I think that you know, particularly, we hear a lot about big data, and it's probably an overhyped word at this point. Um, but the relevance of having these new data and the ability to process it um, is 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 not understated. Uh, it's not overstated. In fact, it's probably understated. Um, I, I think you know, since I've been doing analytics and particularly revenue management and pricing for restaurants for about 15 years now, uh, a lot of the techniques and so forth that we use. Uh, were available to the industry and were being used by uh, the larger chains um, back 15 years ago. Um, what's happened in more recent years is that the availability of this new data, uh, better insight into who your guest actually is, uh, how, they're, how they're changing their purchases based on different stimulus, uh, has really changed um, not just what we can know, but also the size of the types of companies that can employ these kinds of scientific methods to make better decisions about menu and pricing in general. Uh, I'll start before I talk about pricing um, about my uh, four pillars of, of menu management because I think it's important that uh, when you think about your menu and the design, whether you're using sophisticated methods or whether you're just um, putting together a, a rudimentary process, it's important to think of all of your products and all of your categories really in these four different buckets. Um, when we think about, say, sales and profit, which is really what we're going to be talking about primarily today, um, because pricing really affects this line uh, and has the potential to affect um, traffic as well, uh, potentially negatively, potentially positively, depending on what you're doing with traffic. So really the first two buckets are what we'll, what we'll talk about a little bit today. But I think it's also important to note that um, you shouldn't um, you shouldn't just be guided by uh, by sales profit and, and traffic impact of different products. Um, you also need to make sure that you understand product by product what the ex executional complexity is, uh, meaning what's actually going to uh, if you get an order of uh, a dozen of them uh, during your peak hour, uh, is it going to bog down the line? Is it going to stop your throughput? Is it going to uh, increase uh, table times and so forth? Uh, very important um, uh, component. Um, and what we see in, in menu optimization is that oftentimes the menu will expand uh, beyond the point that the kitchen can actually execute. So this becomes an important part of the equation in, in the total profit picture of menus. And of course, brand relevance. Um, you know, these are not uh, in hierarchical order. Probably brand relevance is the most important. Um, if, if a product is not relevant to the brand and the experience that you are offering, then it shouldn't be on your menu. Uh, an example would be, I, I recently was at a uh, Chinese restaurant, um, a chain restaurant in the US, and they had street tacos on the menu. Now, that may have fit all the other buckets uh, appropriately, uh, but it's not, but it's not actually relevant to the brand. So it's sort of a head scratcher to say, well, why, why would you actually you know, put that on your, uh, on your menu? Um, so, so that's just you know mainly to think about. You know, we're, when we think about pricing, we're not just thinking about price in a vacuum. Uh, we're thinking about the the total impact on the menu. So I'll talk real quickly about you know sort of the evolution of restaurant pricing, and um, you know if if you if we go back. In, uh, in time a little bit and think about how the early early days of restaurant pricing was really all cost-based. So whether it was uh, food cost or, or prime cost, meaning 
uh, cost and labor associated with each product. Um, really, the way that that uh, you know the the industry sort of approached this was in, in a time where food was actually the biggest part of your uh, uh, your your cost equation. Um, really, cost factor was was just saying, okay, well, I've got you know it costs me X dollars uh, or pounds to make this uh, uh, this product. Now I'm going to multiply that cost by three, and you know the Swiss were a little bit more sophisticated; they multiplied by four. Um, and that was your price. Um, o over time, and I think some of this had to do with um, how you know, particularly chain restaurants started to mature uh, throughout different uh, trade areas, you started to get more involved in, uh, in competitor pr price benchmarking. So seeing what the competitor is doing uh, and, uh, and either matching the price higher or lower, uh, but using that as the benchmark. The problem with too much focus on competitor pricing is that you're making a pretty bold assumption that your competitor knew what they were doing with the pricing to begin with. Uh, and you're also making an assumption that your experience that you're offering uh, is not significantly different than, uh, than the competitor. Uh, in more recent time, uh, demand-based pricing has become uh, really the forefront of, of how restaurants are, are approaching pricing. Uh, demand-based pricing meaning that we are actually measuring how the consumer responds uh, to, uh, to, to changes in price over time, uh, and therefore making sure that you're optimizing the price of the products and the locations uh, based on how consumer responds to changes in the price. Uh, if you think about you know, the cost factor pricing, you know, the consumer really doesn't care that your uh, cost of beef just went up or that your wage rates are increasing. Uh, they care about what they're, uh, what they're actually getting. So really, demand-based pricing is is going to the consumer and finding out what they're willing to pay for the for the for the overall experience. And when we think about demand-based pricing, we're looking at it at, at multiple different levels. So at really the base level, we're looking um, product by product and seeing you know, as prices change uh, over time or across a system uh, of restaurants, um, how are they responding? Um, if a, if the burger goes up by uh, by X, um, are you are you maintaining the same volume, uh, or is the or is the demand dropping off? Uh, or with the category, as you increase the price of one product, do you see that other products in the category are are, are gaining share, meaning people are shifting out of one product and, and potentially managing their check? Um, also, the market basket. So you know there are a lot of different types of purchases that can happen within a restaurant. Uh, there's snacking occasions. There's full meals. Um, and the more that you can break up what those different market baskets are and track those over time, then you have a much better understanding of, of how people are reacting to uh, different kinds of prices so that then when you are faced with needing to change your prices, uh, you know where to lean into and where you're likely to get the most resistance. And finally, at the store level. Even within the same market, there can be very, very different trade areas, uh, meaning you, know, you can have a, very, a residential district, a high rent district, a high retail district, a business district, and so on and so forth. Um, so when, when you start to price out the products, um, you can have very different um, spending habits and very different resistance uh, levels to, um, uh, based, on, based on different types of stores even within the same, uh, within the same market. So, backing up a little bit into the theoretical, because I think it's I think it's a really important baseline in understanding pricing. You know, I think that a lot of people misuse the word value in this industry. Oftentimes, they're saying this is the value menu, the value item, or whatever, and 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 more often than not, they're really just talking about the lowest price item on the menu. Um, value is a little bit more of a sophisticated uh, um, consideration. When you think about pricing, um, really the you know val value is a function of the price and the experience. So when you think of the top side of this equation, think about the quality of the food, the beverage that you're offering, uh, the atmosphere, uh, and 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 the service level. Right? This equation will define you know. Uh, oftentimes, even the segment, right? So the difference, you know, you may have the same food, beverage, uh, and even close to the same atmosphere, but if the service level can, is different, you know, i.e., uh, full service versus limited service, um, then the price that you charge for that could be uh, could be very different 
in order to maintain the same value. The other, th the other thing to consider about this, and 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 this is, you know, this is not just theoretical. You know, we we create models and we start looking at how the execution of this. So if you've got the exact same menu across ten locations, and um, there are locations that are um, effectively delivering the top side of this equation better than others, and they are all at the same price, um, then then actually you will have pricing power. Uh, oftentimes, uh, in in those in those stores that are executing the top line better, so it's really an important um, uh, an important consideration to 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 make sure that we sort of you know level set what we mean by value. Uh, another unique and uh, dubious distinction of of restaurants is that um, we we have the uh, we have different levels of, of price resistance. You know, if you go into a convenience store or a grocery store, um, you see a bottle of uh, a, a bottle of Coke and um, your point of price resistance is really the, the it's it's one it's one point of resistance. It's the it's whatever the price of that bottle is. In restaurants we have two points of price resistance. The first one is starts with what those prices are on the menu. It establishes a first impression. Um, you start. You need to be careful of certain psychological barriers on 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 different price points. Um, and if if and and oftentimes if you get this wrong, then you'll have people trading uh, trading across uh, across products. So um, when you think of say restaurant behavior, you know if somebody sees prices that they don't like on a menu, in the first visit uh, after a price increase. Typically, they're not going to stand up and walk out. Usually, they're going to continue and, and, and make some sort of a purchase, but they may modify it. So there, are some, there will be some early indicators as to whether a price change was successful or not by understanding how the, the, the product mix in, in your sales is changing. But then we have a second, uh, a second point of price resistance, which is, um, which is the ticket total. So when the bill comes right, and, the, and the total amount that they paid is uh, X, um, this is that moment of truth where people will make the decision whether the total experience was worth what the, what they paid for it, uh, and and therefore um, it's more related to whether you're going to get a return a return visit. So managing both of those is really important. Um, so on the screen now I have uh, a menu engineering grid. And I think where this is helpful is, and, and this has been around the industry for, for a long time, some people will call it the star dog analysis, and uh, it's got a lot of different names. Um, but it basically says that on the, on the, on the y-axis, if uh, how popular is each product, and on the x-axis, down at the bottom, um, how profitable, not in terms of percentage margin, uh, but in terms of dollar margin or penny profit, how profitable is each product when you actually sell it. When you put it onto a grid like this, then you have different uh, strategies that are that are appropriate. So if you think of this one that's out in the uh, outer upper right hand quadrant, these are strengths, right? These are these are those star performers that are very profitable when you sell them, and you sell a lot of them. So this is your bank deposit. So you can either so you need to be very careful with what you do with those. You could use it to if you're going to increase prices, you could target those products, and if it's successful, you could leverage them to make a lot more money. Um, but if you make the wrong move with them, you could actually hurt the business. So the way that this uh, this quadrant chart has been traditionally used for menu pricing is you start with you start with products over here in item A. They're in the upper left hand quadrant. So these are products that are very popular, but they're below average in, in, in item profitability. So if you start by targeting these products, the idea goes that you can increase that and then it's a lateral move into this quadrant all of this is profit we pat each other on, on the backs and say you know look how much more money we're going to make when we increase our prices the problem with it is that it never really accounted for um, decreases in volume that are associated with, uh, with with price increases so what if there is a slight decrease that might be palatable depending on what happens to that volume but what if uh, what if you're going to a price point and the bottom really falls out of that product? Uh, you may have just negated. You, you may have just uh, you may have just damaged the business. Actually, if if this uh, popular item is just falling off the map, 
Um, but what if it is a slight, uh, a slight decrease? Um, that might be okay depending on where that, where that volume is going. Is it staying in the restaurant or are you losing that transaction altogether? If it is staying in the restaurant, is it going to a less profitable item? If it is, then you just negated any benefit from increasing the, the, the price of that product. If it's going to a more profitable, a more profitable item, then, then you may actually make more profit uh, than, uh, than, than, the, than, the price, than the price increase. This, this dynamic is why there's all, there have always been rules about if you increase prices by X, then you're only going to get 50% uh, or 60% or 30% flow through. Um, because when you start increasing prices uh, across a category or across the board, this dynamic exists somewhere on your menu. And if you're not able to call it out and identify it, then sometimes you're going to win, sometimes you're going to lose, and, uh, and the, net, the net benefit is uh, not getting full benefit from the price increase. So when we think about how we manifest that uh, in, some of our, uh, in some of our tools and some of our process, taking the same type of approach and adding a complexity score so that we would know which products are more, uh, are more difficult or more time consuming to, um, uh, to construct but then also adding in the um, uh, price elasticity measure. So it gives another dimension so that as you're going through this uh, process of deciding which products should, uh, should change price, uh, you can do it in a more structured, uh, structured way. Uh, the other component that we talked about uh, very briefly at, at the start is understanding which products have unique reach. And this is important uh, in, in a lot of different um, uh, in a lot of ways, um, not just pricing, but also in total, uh, uh, total menu management, deciding uh, which products to add and which products to take away from the menu. Uh, so TERF stands for Total Unduplicated Reach and Frequency. It was actually a mathematical process that was formulated in, in media optimization that helped to identify uh, if you're on radio or if you're on TV, how do you spread out that message to make sure that you're reaching the right audience? It's recently become uh, a tool in understanding uh, menu optimization because as you look at the as, as you apply it to menus, you can identify which products are likely catering to the exact same audience. So, like in this illustration, the mushroom burger and the and the hamburger might have 90 some percent overlap. And therefore, you're not actually getting any incremental or you know unique customers from that. But if you add a chopped salad, that may it may not be as, as high menu mix, um, but it might actually expand your your reach to a new customer set. Um, so this is really important to know in, in terms of optimizing the menu, but also in terms of making sure that you're you're pricing because you can also apply uh, as we get into market baskets and and tracing the the purchase behavior back to the customer to understand which types of customers um, are, more, are more price sensitive. So to, to give just a, a tangible case of, of how this has been applied, and again, it's been, it's been used in, in chain restaurants for about, uh, for about 15 years now. Um, and while it started with really, uh, when I started in this, in this line of work, you know, really you had to be a billion dollars or more to be able to, um, uh, to apply this kind of science because the data was expensive, harnessing it was expensive, the analyses were expensive. But now it's becoming a much more common uh, approach uh, across even, even small, small chains uh, and in some cases uh, high volume individual restaurants. But here's an example of, um, of how, this is, how this has been used. So um, there was a, a casual dining restaurant that came to us. They had, it had been 18 months since they had uh, changed, their, uh, changed their prices. Um, and wage rates were just about to uh, increase. There was a, going to be a, 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 a pretty substantial increase in most of the markets in the minimum wage. Uh, so they knew that that was going to affect them uh, adversely in terms of their prime costs. The prior price increases <coughs> that they had um, uh, that they had rolled out um, had shown significant traffic drops. So they they had anticipated that. Um, in fact, in one of the price increases, they increased the prices, and then they rolled the, the rolled the prices back. Um, which really did the, gave them the, the, the double whammy uh, because the customers who had 
left because of the higher prices did not come back. Now they had uniform prices across uh, across all locations. So what we did was in in really two phases. First, we we did an econometric analysis. So we analyzed their transaction detail uh, from their point of sale, uh, and we also did a competitor price assessment. So. Um, when I think about competitor price assessment, I think of it as being the guide rails. Right? You don't want to target um, and uh, index directly against a competitor price, but it's important to understand where, where they are in, in relation to where you are. Um, but, that doesn't, um, but that doesn't replace the need to be able to actually measure and see what happens when you change your prices. Um, so we did the analysis to understand what products, what categories, um, encountered the most uh, and what purchase bundles encountered the most and the least um, uh, price resistance. The second phase was what we call store tiering, which was measuring the differences in price sensitivity uh, by taking a two-year history and seeing uh, how the different, actually I think this went back three years, how the different price, uh, how the different uh, stores reacted to price changes. Um, so that we could identify which stores were most likely to actually experience uh, resistance based on uh, resistance if they were to increase uh, increase prices. Uh, we then layered in the different trade area variables, uh, meaning um, demographic, <coughs> competitor profile, um, and identified which products or, or excuse me which which locations were had the most the most pricing power and the least. Um, what we did with this information then, we, we advised them to change from a single, a single price point across their system uh, to, uh, to a, three, a three, price, uh, three different price tiers. Uh, and this was even uh, within markets. So there were some markets where they had three different distinct uh, menus, uh, menu prices within, for the same product within the, uh, uh, within, within the market. Uh, so, so really, the, the details of the solution, the econometric analysis, where we uh, where we measured the price elasticity, uh, and the trading relationships across products, so that we would understand how, if people are showing some price resistance to some products, are they trading to more or less profitable items? Uh, identifying what those purchase profiles were. So, how do the how do the contents of of a purchase change? So, are people starting to manage their check down as uh, as some prices go up? Um, uh, we, we collected and analyzed the competitor prices specifically and uh, targeting some of those entry level price points because uh, oftentimes the most, uh, the most price sensitive customers are going to be uh, uh, affected most by the entry level price points. So, um, uh, so maintaining those in, in relation to, to competitor can be important. Um, also identifying the key risk factors by store. So some of the risk factors that we found were, for instance, guest satisfaction, competitor density, local demographics. Um, the guest satisfaction was a really important one because it was telling us that the customers who were scoring the, the restaurants uh, at a lower level, um, that was affecting the pricing power of these, of these stores. So the people who were, uh, uh, the, the stores that were not performing uh, and delivering that total experience as well as others were showing that they had lower pricing power. Um, we then uh, we then did a test and control, so uh, we didn't just roll it out uh, to the whole system. Um, we did a th uh, three three test pods with the with the client. Um, one of the pods was executing the price recs as the company had traditionally done. So they said we're going to we're going to do our pricing the way that we normally do it. Um, and we're going to give you two pods, um, you know, one where we will target the exact same price increase, and then a third pod where uh, where we were able to do whatever we wanted in terms of to store tiering. Um, so the so we analyzed the test on the, uh, uh, after about three purchase cycles, and I think purchase cycles are, is, is important. Oftentimes, when we're doing, uh, oftentimes when restaurateurs are doing tests, they want this uh, immediate gratification of understanding what happened. But what you really need to understand is how frequent your customers come, and therefore how much time needs to elapse in order for you to, um, in order for you to know actually what where the uh, change is settling out. Meaning, when I think of uh, in terms of a price increase, 
the first purchase cycle, you're likely to uh, see changes in purchases, uh, for, for, but, but not much traffic uh, degradation. In the second purchase cycle, meaning the second time that people would be likely to come in on average, uh, that's when you're most likely to see uh, loss in traffic. Um, by the third purchase cycle, uh, typically you sort of know what your, your, your steady, steady state is and what the, what the consequences were of, of, of the price change. So it's really important that you don't make too many early decisions following a price, price change when you're measuring it. You need to think about what your actual uh, guest frequency cycles are uh, in order to be able to analyze it properly. So, so the results of the of the test, uh, and and by the way, we love tests because you know it helps to um, anytime you can do a test and control or do a holdout group, it gives you a basis of comparison so that you really know uh, really know what the what what the facts are. Um, the uh, the the fishbowl test uh, test test groups uh, outperform the company in all measures. In terms of the flow through to profit, um, our our method achieved. Uh, double the profit flow through that the client's uh, price points did. Uh, the, um, also, our price groups showed no transaction loss at all compared to a negative uh, almost three-quarters of a point loss uh, by the client price group. Uh, and then <coughs> and the profit, uh, profit improvement attributed to our initiative in the, in the first year was about six million dollars. Um, the uh, this was on a on a chain that was um, doing three hundred million in, in revenue. Now, after we had worked with the with the client for for a couple of years, um, their own uh, their own reported benefit from our services over that time period was was about nineteen and a half million dollar profit uh, profit increase. So this is not. You know, our assessment, this is them doing their own internal analysis and attributing um, what they believe came from us by changing the methodology in terms of their, uh, in this case, not just their pricing, but their total menu management. So to summarize, um, you know, when, when we think about uh, you know, price optimization and menu optimization, um, there's a significant advantage and, and ability to improve profit through demand-based pricing rather than cost-based pricing. Because in this case you're actually looping in the, the customer and you're getting them to, you're measuring how they vote with their dollars as your prices change. Pricing differently at locations in different trade areas um, is, uh, is also a, a, a potential um, profit benefit. You also measure, you can minimize your traffic risk by measuring price elasticity. Um, and when you do competitor pricing, uh, don't use it as a, as a direct indexing tool, uh, but use it as a, as, as a guide rail. So now I think we'll pass it over to Joe, who's going to tell us if there are any questions. We have actually, we've, we've received a few questions. Um, okay, Mike. Um, the first one that came over was, "How proven is this methodology?" Um, I, I think it's, it's extremely tried and true. So, you know, if you think of, um, I think when I started this business, I worked with a company called Revenue Management Solutions, who was the first uh, the first company, really anywhere that was was uh, doing demand based pricing. Uh, for restaurants, and there was a, there were a lot of head scratches. Why do I need somebody to help me <laughs> price my menu? Um, but uh, our first major client was um, was McDonald's, um, and we worked with them for probably two and a half, three years uh, domestically before they chose us as their um, as their as their global pricing partner. Um, so I'm I'm no longer with with RMS, but they continue to be the pricing provider for um, uh, globally uh, for for uh, for McDonald's, um, it's also I think you know um, I think over the past ten years has become in in the U.S. anyway has become more common to have a demand-based pricing approach than it is to have a, a cost-based pricing approach for any um, for really any significant chain restaurants. 
Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, there's another question which actually is similar. Um, it says, um, this is all good in theory, but who is actually doing this type of science? I know you've mentioned McDonald's. Um, who else? Yeah. Um, well, I can speak to, I think, in, you know, in the U.S., I know that um, uh, we, you know, some of our clients include um, uh, churches, churches, chicken, Pete's Coffee, Coffee Bean and Tea Leaf, um, uh, Burger King, um, uh, Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. Uh, I could probably rattle off a um, hundred plus uh, chains that are using this in, in some uh, in some capacity. Okay, thanks. All right, got two more questions. Um, this one's, I'm a small chain with limited resources, so what can I do in this world? Well, I, I think that a starting point for anybody who's trying to get more sophisticated about, uh, about pricing um, is, to, is to start with just the basic um, menu engineering grids that I talked about. And, and I think that that, if, if you're not already uh, doing an approach like that, that's a fantastic starting point because it starts to make you think and, and put things through really this four pillar filter and say product by product, I'm going to think strategically about, uh, about what I'm doing. So I think that's a great starting point. The other thing I would say is make, make a real commitment to um, uh, storing and analyzing the data. Even if you're just looking at the mix, make sure that after you change prices, um, you are doing even, even you don't need complex uh, econometric analysis to just see you know, which products changed their mix following a um, following a price change. Um, just rank your your top uh, top 20 items, um, you know, highest to lowest volume, and see if any of those products have substantially changed uh, uh, have substantially changed. Um, we also, you know, we are we are doing this kind of work with, um, you know, with smaller chains as well. So um, it's it's not that it's not always necessarily using the full econometric methods, um, but certainly starting, you know, starting them with uh, with some data and providing some of the tools so that they can look at this in a much more um, uh, in a much more sophisticated way. Okay, thank you. I've got actually got two more questions. Um, this one says. Um, what is the impact on consistency of consumer brand perception impacted by tiered locational pricing? So, I think that's that's a great question, and, and I think it's one that we've always, um, for any chain that is single priced across uh, across the system, it's always the biggest concern. What we found is that most most consumers, because when we talk about say the differential pricing. In a lot of cases, it's not all products. Some of these, uh, you know, it may be the beverages, it may be some of these highly comparable products uh, are, are not significantly different um, from, from one location to the next. But in terms of the profit picture, it can be very substantial. Um, what we found in most cases is that, you know, there, there's, there may be some, you know, anecdotes in terms of somebody responded and said, oh, I saw that this price was different here. Um, but more often than not, we find very little, uh, really no change in behavior and very little commentary. I think that the consumer is, you know, I think 20 years ago it would have been a different, a different question because I think you know back then, really all you know, part of being a brand was having uniform pricing. Um, I think that's changed a lot, and I think that the consumer has started to expect that if they're in a, um, if they're in a residential, you know, neighborhood district. Um, versus a, a high business district, um, they very well might pay something you know different for whether it's a, a cup of coffee or or, or a steak, uh, even from the same chain. So, in in my experience over time, the, there there has there has not been a negative uh, uh, a negative backlash to differential pricing in the same markets, as long as it's um, as long as it's, it's executed properly. Um, we also work with with chains that say you know. Look, um, there needs to be a minimum distance between uh, between stores that are priced differently, uh, or you know, in the same market, it's definitely going to be the same pricing. And then we still do what we can to you know to help optimize that price. 
Okay, thank you. Um, we've still got more questions coming in. So um, this one says, how would you approach a brand new concept? A, a brand new concept. So, so I think that um, I think one of the interesting things that we do. So we're not just using the point of sale data. We're also using direct to uh, direct to consumer uh, surveying. So for a, a new concept that does not have a lot of um, you know historical data or any historical data, um, I would usually start with um, uh, with with a a consumer panel survey. Um, where uh, where you can actually you know ask people within the segment that you're targeting and within the geography you're targeting um, you know what purchase intent would be for you know for different types of products and different types of price ranges and so forth so where that where it, where it does not exist where the, the the historical data does not exist I think there's still a fair bit you can do uh, one of the things that we've we've been doing is is leveraging uh, social media a lot more uh, and understanding you know how Say if, if you know what um, you know what segment or what types of competitors you would be competing with, and trying to determine how to position yourselves. One of the things that we'll do is use the uh, structured uh, review sites, uh, pull the data from there, look at the best and worst reviews, uh, pull their competitive pricing, uh, and understand you know where the different uh, competitive brands are positioned, uh, and therefore where the white space for a new concept may be. Okay, there was actually a little bit more that followed up with that question. Uh, thank you for clarifying. Um, basically, with with that new concept question, it was a, if there is no competitors or little com, um, competition or, or known brands, how would you really kind of start from scratch? Um, I mean, it's it's hard to say with a you know with with, with a hypothetical. You know, I think that um, the the idea that there are no competitors is a little bit is a little bit tough because you're even you know, uh, you know. I'll, I'll give an example. So in the U.S., there are a lot of these emerging um, healthy brands and so forth, and they all think that there are no competitors. But we're all competing for somebody's uh, for for a share of, of of somebody's wallet. Uh, so it may be that you're a meatball chain competing with a salad chain, and it doesn't necessarily you know it does. It seems like you're you're completely unique, but you're taking away from you're taking away from somebody, right? So some of that. You know, overlap analysis and understanding who the who your target customer is um, will will help. I think will help to identify and, and streamline the research. Okay, thank you, Mike. Sorry, there's more questions. Lots of people have got lots of things they want to ask you here. Right. So this next one says Mike has referred to homogenous casual dining restaurants of huge scale, but what about smaller groups that might be individualistic, even with the same back office system? So I guess it's kind of a, a that's quite common over here with pub chains, where it's one brand on on the back end, but each of the pubs are known individually. Yeah, I would say that you know those types of say multi-concept chains are becoming more popular in, in the U.S. as well. Um, so you know we do we do work uh, a fair bit with um, with some of them, where maybe they've only got you know they may have you know 25 restaurants, um, but you know, maybe there's only three under the same uh, under the same banner. So uh, it depends a lot on whether it's just the you know is it the brand that's completely different or is the menu completely different. Um, there there are, there's a lot that we can do with it, and a lot of it depends on how the how the data is being uh, uh, being considered. So if if the back office system is identical is identical, then that helps us in terms of being able to create the database and. Uh, um, and, and still measure because most of the measures that we're doing are measuring restaurant by restaurant. So even with the large chains, we're not just measuring the price elasticity of you know products system wide. Um, we're measuring how the individual locations are uh, are changing in terms of their price resistance. Um, and in fact, even with the large chains, we're doing uh, for for some of them where we work with the franchisees. Uh, we're doing individual uh, individual store reports to help them understand, you know, what their competitive profile is, what their um, what their historical price resistance has been, um, what their trade area um, is like in terms of uh, likelihood of having pricing power and so forth. So, um, you know, there there is there is some more complexity with having, say, you know, a chain 
that is completely you know uh, completely different units um, but but it is uh, it is something that we've done okay thank you Mike all right this one is um, says do you do you price using known price items KPIs as a guide ie get the price of milk right in a supermarket and then make the margin up on unknown price items such as Tabasco um, uh, you know, in, in, for for the restaurants, we we tend, to, you know, we tend to see that the, um, you know, the the grocery. Now there are some cases where I think you know, uh, pre-prepared items from grocery will compare um, will compare back to uh, you know items on on a on a menu. But I think in a in a pure ingredient price, I don't think that the the consumer tends to be doing that calculation because if you think about the value equation, the your your food cost, right? The cost of your product um, is only one component. So you know it's really about you know what's the quality of the food and the beverage, the atmosphere, um, and the service, right? And that in, that total experience at the end of the day is what the consumer is is reacting to. The total experience and the total amount of what they pay. Um, you know, we do do competitive benchmarking in some cases where, say, it's you know whole roasted chickens or something that's very commonly taken from the grocery store. We may do some uh, some competitive uh, benchmarking against grocery, um, but more often than not, the you know the you know say the fast casual chain that's selling it um, has something else about that atmosphere or that service quality that that doesn't happen in the grocery store. So it tends not to be a great uh, predictor of, of price sensitivity. Okay, and this is the last question. Can you explain more about how you can, you test elasticity in an individual dish price? For an individual dish price, well, there has to be some variation in 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 pricing over time. So, when we're actually doing doing the math, we're measuring um, really what how the how the change in the price. Affects the change in 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 the units. Um, in, in this case, I would say units per transaction. So, if we're looking at an individual dish, say we're looking at um, uh, uh, chicken parmesan. Um, so, we are measuring uh, for our clients uh, product by product what the price elasticity is. But if it's been the same price over time, then you won't actually. You, there will be no variation. So, so you can't know how it's going to going to respond. Um, if uh, if there is variation, whether it's across stores selling the same uh, the same product, or whether it's been changed over time, then we're able to actually uh, you know measure how those uh, units per transaction are changing uh, relative to the price changes. Okay, well, thank you, Mike, and uh, that brings us to the end of our webinar. I'd just like to thank everybody for um, attending, and thank you, Mike for uh, sharing all your knowledge. Um, we will be sending a follow-up um, and um, there will be a chance for you to review this webinar again and, and pass it on to any colleagues that weren't able to make it today. So thank you for joining and um, we'll speak to you soon.